So he will present the transeptal ascending aortic axis facilitated coil embolism of type 1 endolic following fenestrated ever. He from the Kishan Medical College, Velo. I think you are the same group of George Joseph, no? Yes, Dr. Yeah. George Joseph. <coughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm presenting this interesting uh, case where we had a type 1 endolic following a fenestrated TVAR. Uh, for which we needed a transseptal ascending aortic access to do the coil embolization. So this is the story of a 73-year-old gentleman who had come to us initially in March 2017 with sudden onset chest pain radiating to the interscapular region. At that time, he was diagnosed to have a type B aortic dissection with an intramural hematoma extending retrogradely up to the ascending aorta and antigradely to the distal DTA. He is also a post-CABG done in 2002 and post-pacemaker implantation for symptomatic six sinus syndrome in 2014. So we did a fenestrated thoracic uh, endovascular aortic repair in April 2017. He had come for a six months follow up at which time he was asymptomatic. However, a CT angiogram showed an endoleak along the DTA, which uh, was presumed to be a type 2 endoleak. So uh, this is basically the baseline imaging prior to TVAR. As you could see, there is a, there is a type B dissection with an intramural hematoma and a, a retrograde extension into the ascending aorta and uh, anti-grade into the distal DTA. This is a 3D reconstruction image showing the same. So this was our initial procedure done in uh, March 2017. The panel on the left showing the pre-procedure angio and the panel on the right is after the fenestrated EVR. As you can see, there is one custom-made fenestration to the left subclavian artery which is flowing well and the uh, dissection was completely sealed. So when he had come back for a six month follow up, we had seen the persistent filling of the endo sac. So uh, at this time it was, and it was in the same location as the initial uh, aneurysm sac as you can see here. So it was presumed to be a type two endo leak. A brief overview of what are the types of endo leak for a lot of beginners like myself. So type one is when you have an in incomplete seal proximally or distally. And this is almost always evident at the time of completion of the procedure itself. And type 2 endolic is what uh, develops later, which is basically due to retrograde filling via collaterals. And type 3 endolic when you have an inadequate graft overlap or graft degeneration. Type 4 endolic is commonly seen at the end of procedure owing to a graft porosity, which basically settles over time. So nothing needs to be done. And type 5, uh, some authors use this, some authors don't. It's basically endotension where there is a con continued filling of aneurysm without any demonstrable leak on imaging. So. We took him up for uh, endoleak repair in November. We had uh, planned an under general anesthesia in prone position for direct cyanoacrylate glue in embolization of the sac. Based on the CT scan, we measured the access point uh, six centimeters from midline to the left and at a depth of six centimeter. And we used a 20 centimeter long 22 gauge EVA needle to enter the sac. And these are the blood pressures. This is a radial arterial line blood pressure. And this is the pressure measured in the aneurysm sac. If you notice the pulse pressure and the absolute pressure are reasonably high, suggesting more of a type 1 endoleak rather than a type 2 endoleak, which would show much lesser, lesser pressure and would, would, would not be pulsatile as well. So this is uh, the CT planning based on which we entered the sac. And this is the sac angiogram. You could actually see dye exiting under the proximal portion of the graft and entering the aorta. And you could also visualize the staining of the thrombus within the sac. So this confirmed the presence of a type 1 endoleak rather than a type 2 endoleak which is initially presumed. So at this time we were actually lost. We had to re-strategize the whole thing. Because uh, if you see on the right, this is the end of the initial procedure in uh, 2017 uh, April. And this is the current one. So there is an evident gap which had formed at the proximal portion of the endo, uh, en endograph which led to this type 1 endoleak which was not there to begin with. This is just a quick recap. So we presumed it to be a type 2 endoleak, turned out to be a type 1 which is usually seen immediately post procedure but uh, unfortunately it ha happened much later. So I will come to why that happened uh, an explanation. So we had to re-strategize it. We in, in fact considered uh, doing a coil embolization through a right radial approach from the subclavian, but because of the subclavian tortuosity that was not uh, felt a viable option. So then we did something that was done prior uh, at our center twice before. So we went on to do a transeptal puncture using a broken row needle through our RFA axis and a check flow sheath was passed into the LA 
for which a swanganz catheter was taken into the ascending aorta and a thermoglidewire was passed through it the soft end was snared out from the right femoral artery thereby obtaining a veno arterial wire loop and over this wire loop we advanced the check flow sheath into the ascending aorta with constant traction at both ends and through this uh, check flow sheath a 4f vertebral catheter was tracked into the mouth of the aneurysm sac and through that we put a cantata microcatheter which enabled us to uh, serially deploy multiple coils here one important thing to remember is to always advance swanganz catheter first before advancing the wire and exerting traction because that may cause significant damage to the tissue especially the mitral valve so this is the serial deployment uh, of coils as you see initially we deploy larger coils as it fills up the space and later on we put smaller and smaller coils so that it forms a compact mass so we had actually totally deployed uh, 18 coils to totally tack down the mass and uh, tack down the track to cut the endo leak so this is the final angiogram at the end of uh, procedure which shows uh, complete cessation of uh, type 1 endo leak so now coming back to why did this happen why was it not there to begin with and why did it happen 6 months down the line on uh, reviewing the images we found there was an extensive aortic remodeling which actually resulted in loss of opposition of endograft with inner curve of the aortic arch if you see this panel this is a picture immediately post deployment where there is a good opposition of uh, endograft to the aorta and this is a picture done 6 months later where there is a certain loss of opposition to the aortic wall and the inner curve of endograft this patient also had multiple other aneurysms he had uh, one at the uh, multiple sacular aneurysm one at the aortic bifurcation one at right common iliac and one at the uh, left internal iliac he underwent a completion procedure 4 months after the endo leak repair we which had uh, bifurcation stenting with sandwich uh, stents to both uh, internal and external bilaterally so at that time we did uh, an early follow up angiogram which you could clearly see there is significant reduction there is only a delayed faint opacification of the sac now this we presume could be a type 2 endo leak which is of no no real consequence so we are just planning to do a ct angiogram one year later so i would like to conclude by saying that an aorta endograft interaction and aortic endo uh, remodeling could lead to endo endo leak formation at any any stage of follow up and landing of endograft from ishimaru zone 0 could prevent this endo leak but it increases the complexity of initial repair just a quick recap of what are ishimaru zones these are basically proximal landing zones in uh, endovascular aneurysm repair zone 0 consists proximal to the brachiocephalic uh, trunk and zone 1 is between the brachiocephalic and the left common carotid and zone 2 was from the between the left common carotid and left subclavian so our repair was a zone 2 repair had we landed the graft in zone 0 would have probably prevented it but it certainly increases the complexity of procedure because we need to preserve both brachiocephalic and uh, left common carotid so it essentially becomes a triple fenestration ivar ct differentiation between type 1 and type 2 endoleak is difficult so sac angiogram helps in confirming the type of endoleak and also aids in treatment planning and transeptal aortic access with arteriovenous wire loop offers a very stable platform for coil deployment under a bird beaking arch endograft thank you thank you kiran for excellent presentation and question from this how often you come across this endoleak in your institution sorry sir in your institution how much uh, maybe around uh, one fifth of the cases have endoleak but as i mentioned most common it, most common endoleak is type 2 often it is of not much uh, consequence so only because this patient had a filling of the initial aneurysm sac we considered intervening him so according to four zone how will decide the prognosis of that basis of the the four zone 0 1 2 3 prognosis pronostic point of view under the for the aneurysm repair yeah. because he had a symptomatic aneurysm and the the filling was again in the initial original sac so that that's why we presumed it was it was significant and leaving it may cause consequences in future we decided to intervene okay thank you very much thanks then dr rajiv ji is there okay rajiv please come so dr rajiv bharadwaj from indira gandhi med college simla and undiagnosed abdominal pain yeah 
ですけど。So only the differential diagnosis of the undiagnosed pain, the cardiovascular disease is coming on. Our patient was 48 years male. He presented with history of pain epigastrium for two years. Pain occurred after the meals and it used to last for around one to two hours. It was being relieved by vomiting. Patient had weight loss of 16 kgs in last one year, out of which around 10 kg occurred in the last three to four months. He was investigated in various hospitals. He had to been to Chandigarh, Delhi, in prestigious institutions of North India. Every time his Investigation used to include uh, ultrasonography, CT abdomen, upper GI endoscopy, and it was found to be normal. In Delhi, he was subjected to CT angiography, which was also found to be normal for coronary arteries. Then this time he was admitted in our medicine department, and they also suspected that he, it could be postprandial angina. So they referred the patient to us for coronary angiography. So in fact, I took the patient for coronary angiography, and since I had experience of five, six such, such cases, so when I took the history on the table, I suspected that it could be abdominal angina. So initially I did coronary angiography, which was obviously normal, and then I did his abdominal autogram to see for the abdominal angina. So we did uh, abdominal autogram and found that there was total near total occlusion of SMA, and there was tight stenosis of the celiac artery. This is the selective NG of the SMA. Hardly any flow in the SMA. Then we cross the SMA with the O14 wire. Then did tandem dilatations with 3 mm balloon. Flow achieved in the SMA. Then we did stent implantation with 6 mm stent. So this was good final flow in the SMA. This was the celiac artery. There was very tight stenosis. We again crossed with O and 4 wire, dilated with 3 mm balloon, and then again implanted 6 mm stent. This is the final result in the celiac artery. On follow-up, all symptoms disappeared. Follow-up after 3, 6 and 12 months, there were no symptoms. He regained 4 kg weight within 1 month. So in take-home message, abdominal pain is very common complaint, but all abdominal pains are not diagnosed with CT, endoscopy or ultrasonography. Abdominal angina should always be kept in mind, especially if there is postprandial pain along with weight loss. Weight loss is very important. If there is weight loss, must suspect that it is postprandial angina. Results of angioplasty are rewarding. Thank you. Thank you, Bharat So one thing that is, is whether it is atherosclerotic or it is stachyshotritis. In the literature cause, around, in particularly in our country, no? More than 95, 90% of the cases of SMS are atherosclerotic. But five, six cases we have done, we found coronary angio, on coronary angio, oh, coronary no, no. disease only in one patient. So most of the patients, maybe there are, there are autoartitis, but we are not very sure. See, high index of suspicion, you can detect more of cases. Devil person like tuberculosis or a, um, occult malignancy or HIV infection, people will come like that. They have so much weight loss that yeah. one of our first patients, we thought he must be suffering from HIV. His so weight was just 30 kg. So we did his HIV status found to be normal. So your impression, this case is atherosclerotic, most likely. Though there is no other obstruction of coronary artery. So we, we are not sure. It could be autoartitis. So uh, autoartitis, you have done the, the angio on the outer. Yeah, yeah, they are normal. Maybe some collagen, collagen vascular disease also. But ESR was normal and the other... Nothing is there. Yeah, they are normal. My index of suspicion will come out. Yeah, no normal. Rarely fibromuscular disease also may involve when no risk factor, nothing is there, everything is normal. So we can explain the disease of fibromuscular disease. Okay, Dr. Bharundaj. Then Salil is there. 
Okay. So again, he is present on the renal angioembolism for the preoperative vasculitis reduction of the tumor before the surgery. My respected dignitaries, I am uh, Sultan Rasling Sali from uh, Pushpagiri Institute uh, from Kerala. Uh, renal angioembolization for preoperative vasculitis reduction before of tumor before surgery. Uh, our patient is a 62 year old male with no comorbidities. He was diagnosed to have angiolipoma affecting the lower uh, <coughs> pole of left kidney. Uh, angiolipoma is a highly vascular tumor and uh, the surgery becomes easier if the vascularity of the tumor is reduced preoperatively. Uh, he is planned for left, uh, left uh, nephrectomy if possible for partial nephrectomy and admitted under uh, urology. Uh, cardiology consultation was kept for uh, uh, checking for options for reducing vascular vascularity before the procedure. Uh, the procedure first the iotogram was done to localize the artery, uh, to localize the feeder vessel, to check for accessory renal vessels, to look for any vessels that have that have been parasitized by the tumor. It is uh, angiomyelopathy is a benign tumor. Usually, it does not parasitize uh, renal cell carcinomas. They usually parasitize other vessels. Uh, after okay, yes. this is the iotogram showing the left uh, left renal artery and we can see the tumor blush in the lower part of the left kidney it was involving around half of the uh, left uh, left kidney po post uh, angiogram uh, uh, the left renal artery was selectively engaged with a uh, 5 french jr 3.5 diagnostic catheter uh, over a O35 uh, thermowire and the uh, left renal angiogram was taken. This is the uh, left renal angio and uh, post that uh, these it was identified that the inferior branch was supplying uh, inferior branch was supplying the uh, tumor. The diagnostic catheter was uh, engaged into the inferior branch of the renal artery. Uh, we can now clearly see the uh, tumor blush. Uh, supplying the whole of the area. It can be seen here. Uh, uh, the options of treatment were discussed. Since this was a larger vessel, uh, we cannot go forward with uh, smaller embolization particles. So it was decided to go forward with coil embolization of the uh, larger large uh, inferior uh, branch of the renal artery. Uh, we used initially a 5 cm to 6 mm MRI embolization coil that partially occluded the vessel and another coil was put 2, m, uh, two cm to 3 mm MRI uh, embolization coil that and, uh, resulted in the total occlusion of the inferior division. This is the shoot post uh, first coil and this is the shoot post the second coil. Uh, a shoot taken a, f a few minutes later showed total occlusion uh, and we can see the uh, staining of the gas, contrast staining of the vessel. A final check shot confirmed vessel occlusion, patient tolerated the procedure well and was uh, shifted to CCU, patient had no complications, shifted uh, in the evening to the uh, urology department and underwent laparotomy uh, next day. Uh, unfortunately he had to go undergo total uh, nephrectomy as the significant real uh, parenchyma could not be saved by a partial nephrectomy. But he could undergo the procedure with uh, reduced morbidity and very uh, minimal blood loss. Uh, take home message, uh, renal angiomobilization uh, or its uh, branches is an effective, minimally invasive technique for reducing vascularity of the kidney in various conditions. The scenarios where it is needed are in renal tumors, either mal uh, malignant, benign, for definitive, adjuvant, or palliative. In our case, it was an adjuvant procedure. Uh, it can be used for renal hemorrhage or massive hemorrhage secondary to uh, trauma or tumor, in AE fistulas, renal artery pseudoaneurysms, or branch aneurysms. Uh, th uh, there have been uh, cases in which they have used it for graft intolerance syndrome. That is, the graft that has uh, undergone failure is producing reaction to the patient. So for uh, removing the effect of the graft and patient it has also been used in ESRD with resistant hypertension in, in end state disease with both kidneys not functioning taking off a kidney will uh, reduce the resistant hypertension and it also has been uh, used to reduce the size of the kidney in ADPKD at one year there is 50% reduction in the size of the ADPKD that will uh, relieve the pain of the patient 
and also res uh, reduce the risk of hemorrhage of the ADPKD. In these scenarios, the uh, interventional cardiologist can extend a helping hand to the surgeon. Thank you. What the diagnosis is angiolipoma? Uh, it was diagnosed by the urologist and us for, uh, for opinion. It was done by a CT. Uh, it was a uh, patient had abnormal pain, diagnosed uh, probable angiomyelipoma by the ultrasound, CT was done to confirm. So any other? Uh, we are, we are okay. routinely, routinely doing preoperatively for renal cell carcinoma, this embolization. And I think instead of coils, because these are costly, we are doing gel There are other options also, if I may have the time. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. So, next speaker, can I call Agrahani, please? Oh, you're talking. Okay. Please come. He is from Apollo Hospital. Very, it also in very interesting case, bilateral massive deep thrombosis in a combination of May Turner syndrome and the heart syndrome. Start. Uh, respected chairpersons, uh, senior colleagues, especially my teachers who are sitting here in front of me. And it is a privilege to, uh, this is not actually our forum, but uh, over the last six, eight months, our uh, urologist has been doing a lot of uh, post PCNL bleeds because uh, what we tracked, I was discussing with Dr. Rishi, he does the cases in the night and the precision goes down. And we have done almost 14 uh, post PCNL uh, pseudoneurysms in the last six months. Initially, we used to do it with coils, but then we devised our own method which is very uh, safe, effective, and very cost, uh, you know, cost effective. Uh, uh, a 43-year-old man <coughs> present in this case because he had multiple uh, pseudoneurysm was operated for left nephrolithiasis and PCNL was done in, at around 12 o'clock in the night. Uh, he kept on getting hematuria post-procedure for a month and uh, his hemoglobin dropped from 13.6 to 6 grams per deciliter. He was referred from the Department of Urology as a last resort measure to us for renal angiography and needful. And uh, pre-procedure creatinine that we did was 1.1 milligrams per deciliter. And TLC was 7,200, ultrasound was unremarkable. Uh, renal angiography that we did revealed a normal right renal artery, but left renal artery angio showed two leaking pseudoaneurysms not picked by the renal Doppler. You can see, uh, if you appreciate the anatomy, he has an accessory renal artery, and both the pseudoneurysms are arising from the accessory renal artery. They are uh, probably con uh, a needle stick accident, having the same track, and uh, the left right renal artery was normal. The whole tree is normal. The strategy that we decided was to do selective embolization of both of the pseudoneurysms. The route taken was right femoral artery. Guiding we used was a renal double curve, uh, six French. The wire was BMW exchange length, 014 inch wire. And a cantata, 2.6 French microcatheter from Cook. And we, the embolization that, uh, uh, that we decided was with PVA 300. <coughs> PVA is also supplied by Cook. So uh, we hooked uh, with the renal double curve. It was a challenge to go to the neck of the pseudoneurysms, but finally we managed. You can see our wire, it is reaching the neck of the pseudoneurysms. And uh, once we were there, then we threaded in our uh, cantata microcatheter. After advancing, 
we take the wire out and embolize it with PBA 300. Here you can see. This is while you're embolizing, you see the dot is the tip of the microcatheter. There is another uh, upper pseudoneurism in the middle lobe, arising from the same accessory renal artery. We wired it again, and uh, same way we embolized it with PBA. Both the pseudoneurisms got sealed. You can see the final shot. And we have done it super selectively. You know. Post-procedure hematuria settled completely five days uh, post-procedure. His hemoglobin improved to 10.6 in one month. He has completed four months of follow-up. Dye used was iduxanol 45 ml, and 48 hour creatinine was 1.1. There are some technical tips. Do not open the PVA vial till your microcatheter is in. Always flush the microcatheter with saline and make it air-free. Attach a three-way. Then the way you do your uh, uh, agitated saline contrast. Similarly, in, on one side, in 10 cc, put saline. On another side, take 1 to 2 cc and agitate them. And when you, once you are ready, attach two syringes and mix the particles and agitate and inject. Do not rewire the lumen of the microcatheter. Move it out straight away. Take a check shot after two minutes. Some flank pain in the evening is normal because there is a little bit of you know, ischemia, which can be treated with tramadol and paracetamol. Points to point. Super selective renal artery embolization is performed in emergency cases of iatrogenic post PCNL bleeding. Advantages of embolization are minimal invasiveness, few complications done under local anesthesia. PBA 300 may be an excellent option to seal necks of pseudoneurisms. ACFs, that means arteriocalicil fistulas and arteriovenous fistulas, which, which are created by post PCNL. It needs utmost care. Check shots while instilling the particles of, are of paramount importance to prevent spillover into the normal circulation. And larger necks or subsegmental arteries can be embolized with the help of perfusion balloons or coils. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any question from the? Okay, thank you.